11. Let us read uh, God's word uh, together as we read uh, God's word. Pay attention. You know, this is what we are going to study. You know, we can read together. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let us read together. He should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I hope that you are reading from uh, Philippians now. There is only 101 verses as we said. There is four chapters. Remember that it is a letter. So nobody will write a letter in chapters, right? So it is just a letter. So it is chapter and verse division all came later. So this is just read it as a letter. Paul was in prison and uh, when he was writing this letter as we know. Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and uh, because of the riot that the Jewish people, you know, raised against him, the charge that raised against him, he brought a Gentile person to the temple. So they just were looking for an opportunity to speak against uh, Paul. So they, the mob came and all kinds of things, the civil unrest was going on at that place. And finally the Roman authorities arrested him. And uh, the Jewish people tried to kill him, so he was moved to Caesarea. You read that in uh, Acts chapter 21, 22 and 23. And he was there and uh, waiting for his trial. Uh, uh, Governor Felix kept him there in the prison for uh, two years. And he was waiting for his trial over there, Acts chapter 24, that we read that story. After Felix, the governor Festus came to power and authority. And he also knew about the story about Paul. And he kept him over there. When King Agrippa visited Festus, he showed the interest to see a Paul. So he came and talked to him and Paul was trying to defend his case one more time before this governor and also this king. You read that story in Acts chapter 25 and 26. And finally, since he was a born uh, Roman citizen, he pleaded his case with the emperor. So he was transported to Rome because of that. We read that story in Acts chapter 27. The journey are they are taking to go to Rome. Finally, he came with uh, so many shipwrecks and difficulties as they faced. They end up in Rome. And uh, he was in Rome for two years. Uh, he was arrested. He can rent a home there. And he was living there at that time that we read in Acts chapter 27 and 28 again. He was waiting for his uh, trial before the emperor, pleading to his case. Don't know what is going to happen. Maybe he may be executed or maybe released. He has no clue what is going to happen. So he is waiting at that time. That is where he write uh, this letter to his beloved church in Philippi. There is, the, the reason that he was writing is this, you know, he was responding. You know, when you read a letter, we try to understand the other side also. Because we are only one side of the story here. So we have to assume it, you know. You know, when we are uh, making a phone call, then you hear that, you know, when I talk, you may assume so many other things actually. You know, because you don't hear what the other person talking, only I hear. So when you read the letters also, you should assume the other side of the story also. So this is what it is. When, from the reading of the letter, we can assume and understand is this. The people at Philipp, Philippi, the, the, the church over there, they were worried about uh, Paul. They thought that Paul is already frustrated because of his imprisonment over here. This trial is you know, going forever. Nothing is happening. He may be frustrated. Or because of the imminent death, Paul may be afraid or may be desperate and discouraged. That is maybe their assumption. But Paul is responding to them and says, that, no, that is not the case. I am not worried. I am not frustrated. I am not concerned about what is going to happen to me. My concern rather is about you. And I want you to know that I am joyful and I want you to be joyful also. And I want you to know that only thing that will break my heart, that will bring me difficulties or a discouragement is this, that when I know that you are not walking worthy of the gospel or there is divisions among you, if that is the case, that will bring sorrow to me. So that is what Paul is writing. So then the story continues over there. Paul write them back and say that rejoice in the Lord. And he repeat that again 15 times in various ways and say 19 times various ways he says that rejoice again and again and again. That's what he says. So this is a church. This is a very good church. You know, Paul loved this church. He has a good relationship with the church also. There was no ethical issues in this church like the church at Corinth or like uh, any heretical teaching or any doctrinal errors like in the church in Galatia. This is a church. There was, you know, there was a church in uh, Orthodox in its faith and they know what they believe 
and not only that there is no other uh, no ethical issues they have all of them are living according to the scripture and the commandments of god then what is the issue over there a church that is you know ethical in in rightly standing before god doctrinally correct but paul says that there is a there is a sense of discord there is a sense of disunity maybe among this church over there so remember that word actually there is orthodox in faith but they are they have disunity among the people so that is the context that paul writes from chapter 1 verse 27 through all the way in chapter 2 that we see paul says that i want you to be united in purpose you have to be one like a one man and one in spirit that will bring joy to me and he gives the examples of christ in that place so that is what we are going to look this morning look at that the purpose of unity why we have to be united paul says that paul says that will bring my joy complete that make my joy complete so the bible tells us that the joy joy in unity and harmony and there is no joy in conflict and in division right there is joy there is a you know sense of belongingness when we are together but there is conflict and divisions there is no joy at all the bible says in psalms 133 words 1 there is only three verses in that psalm look at that verse that we read over there psalms 133 it says how good and pleasant it is when god's people live together in unity how good and pleasant it is when god's people live together in unity it is like precious oil pour out poured on the head running down on the beard running down on aaron's beard down on the collar of his robe it is as if the dew of hermon were falling on mount zion for there the lord bestows his blessing even life for evermore where there is unity there is god's blessings is bestowed upon them so unity there is in a personal level there is a unity it says james says that if a double minded man is unstable in all his ways so we should be united in ourselves in purpose we should be united in families you know when the husband and wife always bickering and you know complaining and arguing that is not the right way a christian family should live as a church that is what we have to do. we should be united in our purpose because that will bring joy to all of us that will bring joy to the heart of others so see us also that is where the psalmist says god bestows his blessings and even life for evermore so joy the purpose of joy is that that will bring yeah, the purpose of unity is that that bring joy not only that this is the greatest demonstration of the gospel that is a, the unity is the demonstration and the defense of the gospel remember that it is not when there is miracles happen that people know that we are god's people when we love each other that is where the people know that there is something different remember that because you know we are living in a selfish world everybody is talking about themselves what i will get out of these things that is the world that we are living in but we are able to live above that love each other when the world sees that they know that what they believe is true jesus said in john chapter 13 verse 35 now that is a good word for us to memorize as a collective body i believe look at that words john chapter 13 verse 35 by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another the greatest defense and demonstration of gospel within the church is that when we love one another when we love one another john chapter 17 verse 20 and 21 jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer this is what jesus says my prayer is not for them alone i pray also for those who will believe in me though through their message that all of them may be one father just as you are in me and i am in you may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me you know remember that when paul writes about this one other thing keep in mind this is not talking about the unity about all the christians in the world this is not an experiment it's an ecumenical experiment or expression you know remember that it is easy to pray for the people those are suffering for christ in in uganda or nigeria or in iraq very very easy you can pour out your heart you can scream and shout and cry jump and dance all the things but this is not talking about that but it is more difficult to love the people those are sitting next to you that is a more difficult thing you agree with me that there's old saying it says that 
to live above the saints we love oh what glory will be but to live below the saints that we know well that is another story you heard me say right what it says to go to heaven and enjoy time together with all the saints it is a glorious thing but look at each other and say that love each other here that the people that we know it is another story so paul says to them we our greatest demonstration of gospel should be what when we love each other so the purpose is this that bring joy not only that that demonstrate the gospel we can say all kinds of things but at the end of the day we are not able to get along each other none of those things has no value whatsoever at all that's what paul says the third thing the second thing is that the essential elements of unity that paul says in chapter 2 you know we don't have the time today just run over these things for you and you read it and study by yourself chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 if you have any encouragement from being united in christ if any comfort from his love if any fellowship with the spirit if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete paul says four things that is essential ingredients for unity one is this consolation or encouragement that we know that we are being united with uh, jesus christ we are united with the christ the second thing the comfort of his love god's love in people's our hearts produces spiritual unity you know when we know that god loved us dearly what is the result what is the expression that comes out of us then we want to love one another so in order to love each other first we have to experience god's love in us so there is a there, there is a consolation encouragement knowing that i am united with christ there is a comfort of god's love within my heart and there is the communion of the spirit there is a personal intimate relationship relationship with the holy spirit what happened then i know that i am sensitive to the holy spirit that helps us to live in unity within the body of christ because of that not only really that you know there is a compassion for others as we read in the beginning in the morning remember that what we read god has mercy towards us god showed his compassion to us that was the reason that we are sitting here this morning so how do we do to others then we do the same thing for ingredients that we need to have in our lives to create unity within the body of christ the consolation the comfort of god's love the communion with the holy spirit and the compassion for others then paul says the reason for disunity verse 3 why there is you know discord within the church or what is the reason of it verse 3 do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others better than you yourself very simple to understand that what are the two things paul says over there two things one is selfishness self interest and self importance now we all talk about our rights actually right you know me mine you know the other day we were praying and blessy was trying to teach uh, alexis to say amen you know blessy said say amen she said mine you know when we say again that say amen say mine you know i think that is a good lesson i learned a good lesson out of it actually this is what all of us mine me my feeling my right what is our right when we come before god then selfishness self interest and self importance do you know who i am some people don't even know who they are you know so they ask others actually they want others to affirm them who they are very difficult deal with those kinds of people actually that is one of the reason there is this discord or disunity within the church and paul used that word vain conceit or selfish ambition arrogance pride self importance superiority complex all those things come together that is the reason there is discord within the church the, again paul is not writing about everybody over there he is talking about the church in philippi so we are talking to us now remember this is a difficult thing to talk but this is very important selfishness self importance self conceit these things will always bring division within the church then paul bring the secret of unity what is the secret how we can be united paul says something over there paul says that unity is not an external thing by the way unity is not uniformity either i can tell you next sunday onwards you all come with a white dress all of you will come i like color by the way you know when i stand here and look at you beautiful wonderful you know so you all come with a white dress you know white pant white 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 uh, collar white all the things you come so other somebody look up out, outside they may look like it's a uniformity 
But uniformity is not unity. Union is not unity either. So you can put two, a cat and a dog together make a union. But that's not unity. So Paul is not talking about unity. He is not something external. Rather it is internal. It is a mindset. It is an attitude. The word mind that Paul used many occasions in this epistle that you read. I, I hope that you might have seen that. You read that again and again you see. Paul says that a mind that is filled with the good things. You know, lovely things. Holy things. Then he says about a mind that is like-mindedness. One in mind. Then Paul says that we should have the same mind of Christ. The different ways that Paul used the word mind. But when talk, Paul talks about mind, it is not about a psychological thing. It is not about IQ. Rather, he talks about a perspective. He talks about a mindset. He talks about an attitude. That is an important thing. You know, I hope I have time to tell you this. But you read actually about attitude itself. You know, there is a John Maxwell wrote about attitude 101. There is a small book. You can read. You can finish it over there. There is another book uh, called The Awesome Power of Attitude by Dale Gowley. It's a good book. Only two cents actually for that book on Amazon. If you get, you know, you can get it. By the way, we have the Amazon Smile for ICF. That is a commercial in between. Yeah. So <laughs> I remember that also. So we can, you know, buy things through that and we'll get a percentage of it from that. Amazon Smile. You can sign up for that also. Anyway, you can get the, so attitude is very important thing. John C. Maxwell said about attitude, this is what he said, our attitude is the librarian of our past, spokesman of the present, the prophet of the future. It is the librarian of our past, spokesman of the present, it is the prophet of the future. That means this is what the attitude, that is the most important thing. And he writes this, next to knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, nothing is more important than having a good positive attitude. You know, after being saved, the most important thing in life is what? It is about our attitude, having a good positive attitude or it is our mind. You know, Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2, you read that. Mind or our attitude, our perspective is very important. So our attitude reveals our true character, who we are. We cannot hide it at all, you know. We can just hide it for a few minutes or a few hours or a few weeks maybe, but this will jump out one way or the other. <laughs> that is what attitude, because that is our true self is who we are. Our attitude becomes later our actions or reactions. You know, that will come out. That will be come out in some way or the other. The attitude, not only that, the attitude is our choice. That is what I want to say. The attitude is my choice. Look at Paul here. Where is Paul? Paul is in prison. He doesn't know what is going to happen to him next. So he may be executed or he may be released. You know, he has no clue what tomorrow waits for him. But what is Paul's attitude and perspective and mindset towards his life? What we read in this four chapters, what we read? He tell them, rejoice, rejoice, and rejoice. Again I say, rejoice. So it was his choice to rejoice, not in circumstances or in any other thing. Rejoice in the Lord. It was his choice. So our attitude is my choice. Whether it is towards circumstances or towards people also. Remember that. That is, if you have a bad attitude, it is very difficult to get along with people. That will spoil our relationship always. Whether it is in the family, between husband and wives, or between parents and children, or in between the church, or in the workplace, wherever it is, this attitude is, the mindset is a very important thing. So we have to be very careful, you know, about how we demonstrate this, our dispositions and reactions to other people. Because if you don't control that, sooner or later, that will destroy the unity within the church and in the family and with other people also. So it is very serious thing, I believe, that we talk about over here. So as a Christian, we have the right to choose how to respond in any given circumstance and situation. So Paul here says that we should have the right attitude, right attitude. Then he says, give an example about that right attitude. And he gives, talk about Jesus Christ over there. Chapter 2, verse 5 onwards. This is one of the marvelous portions in the New Testament that we see. So we don't have the time to dissect it. We can learn some other time. But you look at that, that portion of what it says. It says about the attitude, the, the model, the example of Jesus. We read earlier in John chapter 17, verse 20, that the Father and He is in one. So Jesus did everything according to the will of the Father. 
they were united in purpose at all the time that paul is encouraging to find joy in following the attitude and the example of our lord jesus christ in philippians chapter 2 paul talk about this marvelous passage he talk about the pre existence of jesus who being god then he talk about the menial position that he took he became a man he talk about the obedience that he has shown he was willing to die he talk about the resurrection that happened after the death then he talk about the exaltation the result of all those things that is what we read in chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 you read that verse please some other time so this is paul gives the example jesus being god who had all the right to being god what he did he left all the glories he left his right he didn't exercise or used any of those rights at all so when we come before the church when we come before the cross before communion before god's presence the simple question we have to ask to ourselves is that we come before a god come before jesus who chose not to exercise his right what is my right what is my right there when we see the sacrifice of christ what is the question that we ask and i remember that when we come to god's kingdom there is no right at all whether you like it or not there is no right at all because whatever we have received is by grace by mercy we don't know first came that since i did because of this or that at all no it is by god's mercy so here we read you know paul says that there is one thing i will finish over here paul says that how we can overcome this this sense of importance or selfishness how we can overcome it paul says that if you have a sacrificial mind that will bring a sacrifice submissive mind that will bring sacrifice and service if you have a submissive mind that is what the, jesus did jesus submitted himself to the father he did not consider equality with god something to be grasped rather what he did he just let it go he submitted himself to the will of the father when we submit our selves our mind our attitude to do god's will the sacrifice and service will come automatically that we can do anything then joyfully that is what we say there is no bigger or small work in the kingdom of god whether you are sweeping the floor or preaching the pulpit there is nothing big or small at all because why we do it we surrender submitted our life to him so what we do then we do this joyfully all the things all the service that we do paul gives an example of christ here an example about himself then paul gives an example about timothy then paul gives an example of epaphroditus those that is what chapter 2 is all about this is what the context of it so how we overcome this attitude we'll finish here with a practical application how how did you develop an attitude and cultivate the mind of christ how we can do that in our homes how we can do that number 1 paul says here consider others better than ourselves every person those are sitting next to you every person you are married to every children that we have every relationship that we have we need to understand that they all are created equally in the image of god as a christian go we further and say that not only that they were purchased by the blood of jesus christ himself so they are valuable to god so we have to value them in such a way that is the only way we can live in unity in in relationship in you know, especially in families you know in church you know both are family we only they are everybody is valuable that me i am willing that's what jesus did in john chapter 13 you know everybody is more the more valuable than me the second thing is how do we take care of our thought life the last chapter that we read in chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 paul says this this is a good words for all the young people to memorize this i told you this many times do it the last part of it that we read finally brothers verse 8 for chapter 4 verse 8 finally brothers whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things so what do you do then focus fix your thoughts on these things think thoughts on what on right thing noble thing lovely thing holy thing some people just dwell on negative all the time what happened then when we are filled with the negative we see only negative all the time 
So people can only see negative in other people because they are negative themselves. So fix on the, these things. So we screen our thought. What we are getting in, garbage in, garbage out. So we have to be examine what we are getting into our thoughts. And not only that, we have to nourish. We have to nourish with the God's word. There is something called affirming God's word. Affirming is, means that we are making a positive choice in our lives to dwell on what is right. That is, for a Christian or a, as a believer, that should be God's word all the time. Remember that, as we are living in a visual world, so what we watch is very important also. So make sure that you try to see things through God's perspective and store that into our mind. And finally, very simply that we can say that, let the Christ example, we, let, let us emulate the example of Christ into our lives. This is the greatest example that we read. Being God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But let him go it. For what? To serve people like us. <clears throat> people like us. So let us pray that let this mind be in us. Let this mind be, let attitude will be among us. And this attitude will be between us. Would you please pray for that? So we'll sing one more song. And we'll take the offering at that time. And we finish. And I, I, you know, if you need the notes, I can send you this also. But I believe this is very crucial also. You learn this in chapter 1 and 2. In your family prayers, in your private prayers, pray that. What is the purpose? Why there is discord among us if it is the case? Come back to this Philippians chapter 2. Look at the example of Jesus in that part. And pray that Lord help me to follow that example in such a way. So let us worship the Lord with our giving. And we pray and finish this morning after that.